Then Moses went up, to, went up from the plains of Moab to Mount Nemo, to the, tout of Pish, to the top of Pishgah, which is opposite Jericho. And the Lord showed him the whole land, Gilead as far as Dan, all Nephtali, the land of Ephraim and Manasseh, all the land of Judah as far as the western sea, the Negeb and the plain, that is the valley of Jericho, the city of palm trees, as far as Zohar. The Lord said to him, This is the land of which I swore to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, saying that I will give it to your descendants. I have let you see it with your eyes, but you shall not cross over there. Then Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab at the Lord's command. He was buried in the valley of the land of Moab opposite Beth Peor, but no one knows his burial place to this day. Moses was 120 years old when he died. His sight was unimpaired, and his vigor had not abated. The Israelites wept for Moses in the plains of Moab 30 days. Then the period of mourning for Moses was ended. Joshua, son of Nun, was full of the spirit of wisdom, because Moses had laid his hands on him, and the Israelites obeyed him, doing as the Lord had commanded Moses. Never since has arisen a prophet in Israel like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. He was unequaled for all the signs and wonders that the Lord sent him to perform in the land of Egypt against Pharaoh and all his servants and his entire land. And for you and for all the mighty deeds and all the terrifying displays of power that Moses performed in the sight of all Israel. It's God's good word for us, God's beloved people. Thanks be to God. So, I don't need to tell y'all that we've lived through a remarkably strange million years in the past eight months. We, we had this coronavirus lockdown, and then after the lockdown, we live in this like weird limbo time where it's not normal, but it's not the lockdown. And so, what is it? Well, People have been begun studying what's been going on in the lives of people for the past few months. And one of the they, things they have found is that life during lockdown, uh, people fell back on some weird old habits. So liquor sales increased by 27% in the first three months of lockdown. In places where weed is legal, like Denver and Reno, weed sales were up by like 400%. Um, also, as of August, two-thirds of normal church attenders were not currently attending in-person worship. So, like, things got a little strange. We, uh, perhaps, as a nation, as a people, fell into some bad habits uh, during lockdown. It also put a real strain on family dynamics, on uh, parents who are having to homeschool uh, children or having to di distance learn with children, uh, and spouses who are used to their spouse going to work and now found their spouse in the house all the time. Um, and so I began uh, tro trolling Twitter uh, to learn about the strain that perhaps a coronavirus has uh, put on our lives. And so I, have, uh, I present to you now a selection of the joy that I found. Um, so my first one, this may be one of my absolute favorites. You can be a calm, rational person who doesn't rage eat potato chips before 10 a.m. Or you can be a parent of children doing online school. You cannot be both. This, this one's great. This one has nothing to do with anything. It's just hilarious. I love the creativity of this child. One kid in my daughter's first grade class figured out how to change the background to an Amtrak, and he'd yell in the middle of class, gotta go, my train is here. <laughs> love the first day of school pics of your children with their laptops at the kitchen table, especially with the flowers strategically placed in the background. But we should also get to see the pics where everyone, pics where everyone is losing their absolute fill in the blank and screaming that everything sucks because balance. Virtual school vocabulary list. Irish coffee, screwdriver, rage eating, desperation, mojito, time out, exasperation. Kids teacher on Zoom. Hi, Miss Brown. It's nice to see you again. What is that lipstick? I love it. Me, it's not lipstick, it's wine. I started drinking at 7 a.m. today. Day three of quarantine and distance learning from home. Six-year-old writes a biography titled, Why I Hate My Family. See, the kids are feeling it, feeling it too. Day three of homeschooling. My kids are bullying the teacher by body shaming him just because he has long nose hair. 
For the love of all that is good in this world, can we just, just for a minute to have a minute to ourselves? If hiding in the pantry is what it takes, then hiding in the pantry is what is going to happen, period. No shame in our game. <laughs> now, that was family, so now we're going to switch to some, some relationships with spouses. What I've learned about my partner in quarantine is that they have literally no flaws. Help, I am a marginally housebroken raccoon. If my husband farts one more time, it won't be the virus that takes him. <laughs> Wife, if we're both going to be stuck in the house together for the next month, you really need to stop doing that. Me, stop doing what? Th that. <laughs> wife, my wife and I play this fun game during quarantine. It's called, why are you doing it that way? And there are no winners. My husband is suddenly the world's foremost expert in the best way to clean a kitchen, something he has never done in the five years of our marriage. I reveal a different one of my annoying tendencies to my wife each day in quarantine, just to keep our relationship spicy. Home quarantine status. My husband has learned how to play beat it on the ukulele and tried to show me, but I locked myself in the bathroom. And to put it succinctly, 2019, husband is annoying after two hours. 2020, husband is annoying after two minutes. <laughs> so I really enjoyed this process of finding these for y'all because, look, they're funny. But they speak to a real deep truth that the past eight months has put a strain on us in a lot of places. And that strain shows. That strain certainly shows up in increased liquor sales. That strain shows up in lower church attendance. That strain shows up in the dynamics within families and the dynamics between spouses. The coronavirus has put a strain in a lot of places. And now strains often lead us to begin to fall short in ways that we did not normally. Right? We probably didn't drink wine before 7 a.m. to help get through homeschooling. And yet liquor sales have now gone up 27%. It is easy, particularly when under a strain, to get pulled backwards, to begin to fall short. And what I want us to walk away from here knowing is that that doesn't settle the matter. We don't have to stay that way. If something new has popped up in our lives that has led us to fall short, it's okay. Because we can always turn away from that and turn back to God and be welcomed back by God with open arms. As the nature, truest nature of God's love is that ability to meet us where we are, whatever that new thing that has popped up that has led us to fall short, and welcome us back with loving arms, back into God's love, back into a new way of living. That actually sits at the heart of this story about Moses' death. It is a story about a man who falls short, but does not stay there. Because on the surface, if you look at the nature of this story, it can be really sad. Like it comes off as a really sad story. Moses has poured his heart and soul and life into leading these people to the promised land. He has had to stand up to Pharaoh. He has had to wander in the wilderness for decades. He has had to shepherd these cantankerous, crazy people for years. And he gets to the bank of the Jordan. He can see the promised land, there on the other side of it. And he is not allowed to enter. Instead, he gets this last tantalizing vision of how far they've come. And then that is where he passes away. As it says in Exodus 32, verses 48 through 52, on that very day, the Lord addressed Moses as follows. Ascend this mountain of Abram, Mount Nebo, which is in the land of Moab, across from Jericho, and view the land of Canaan, which I am giving to the Israelites for possession. You shall die there on the mountain that you ascended. 
and, excuse me, and shall be gathered to your kin, as your brother Aaron died on Mount Or, and was gathered to his kin. Because both of you broke faith with me among the Israelites at the water of, water, waters of Mirbah Kadesh in the wilderness of Zin, by, fa by failing to maintain my holiness among the Israelites. Although you may view the land from a distance, you shall not enter it, the land that I am giving the Israelites. He gets so close. But he is not allowed to enter because he has fallen short at this place called Mirabah Kadesh. Now what happened at Mirabah Kadesh is a story that plays out over and over and over again throughout the Exodus, throughout their journey um, from Egypt uh, to the Holy Land, to the Promised Land. Uh, the people have run out of water and they cry out to God, God, why did you bring us out of the land of Egypt so that we could die of thirst in the desert? We should have gone back to Egypt. And so once again, God and Moses have to show the people God's power, and God and Moses have to demonstrate to the people how far they've come, that God is going to take care of them. And so Moses has one job to do. All he has to do is strike a rock with his staff, and God is going to make water come gushing out of it. This happens in Numbers chapter 20. But instead of striking it once, Moses strikes it twice. And that is why he doesn't get to enter the promised land. Because he struck the rock twice instead of once. And what I see on the faces of some of y'all is, what's the big deal? Why does that matter so much? Good question. It showed a lack of trust in God. It showed at least a momentary loss of faithfulness. This is, I'm going to hit this twice because I'm not sure if I hit it once, it's going to work. Or, I'm so mad at these people, I'm mad at God, I'm just going to keep whacking this thing. We don't know exactly the nature of how Moses lost faith, but we know here represents a moment where he lost trust in God and failed to show the true holiness of God, which was literally his job as the living mouthpiece of God. Moses has this role of prophet, which means he does all of the talking for God. And here, Moses the prophet has this moment where he loses faith, loses sight of God, loses sight of the big picture. He smashes the rock twice, and he doesn't get to enter the promised land. And here, what we see in the death of Moses, part of what we see here at the death of Moses, is that plays out. Moses has reached the end of his days. He's had his 120 years in this world, and he dies there on the mountain in full view, but not getting to enter himself. And if we leave it there, I think that's kind of sad, right? Seems a little harsh too, but certainly feels pretty sad. Thankfully, though, that is not actually how this story ends. Yes, Moses does die on the wrong side of the promised land line, but it is not nearly as bad for Moses as this version that I've told you makes it sound like. Because the truth is, Moses got it back together. Mirabah Kadesh doesn't represent the end of Moses' relationship with God. No, he keeps serving God even right until they're about to enter the promised land. He continues, he picks himself up, scrapes himself off, and continues to serve God for the rest of his natural life. And as he dies, we get a very different image than that of one who has been rejected and punished by God. Here again, the words of verses 5 through 8. Then Moses, excuse me, then Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab at the Lord's command. He was buried in a valley in the land of Moab opposite Beth Peor, but no one knows his burial place to this day. Moses was 100 year, 120 years old when he died. His sight was unimpaired and his vigor had not abated. The Israelites wept for Moses in the plains of Moab 30 days, and then the period of mourning for Moses ended. Joshua, son of Nun, was full of the spirit of wisdom because Moses had laid his hands on him, and the Israelites obeyed him, excuse me, doing as the Lord had commanded Moses. 
All right, pop quiz. Y'all just heard it. Who buried Moses? God buried Moses. That's why no one knows, right? If no one, if someone knew, if someone had done the work to bury Moses, then someone would know where Moses is buried. But no one knows where Moses is buried. God did the work of burying Moses. That's a really loving act. Normally, as today, it would have been the family members of Moses who would go and bury the one who has passed. Instead, God does the work of the family and buries Moses, essentially honoring Moses by taking the time to bury his, God's beloved servant. It is God showing that God was not done with Moses, that God was not done loving or caring for Moses, that there is more to this story than just a man who did not get to enter the promised land. And that, so this idea that they, that they mourn for Moses for 30 days, you see the law required that you mourn for a beloved parent for 30 days. And so this is essentially Moses being declared by the people, the father of God's people. That the people had not forgotten how much Moses mattered and that God had not forgotten how faithful Moses had turned out to be. That Moses is the final thing that happens between Moses and God is not one of punishment but a loving burial by God in God's self. And then we get the last few verses of our story today is essentially the, the, the eulogy or the epitaph or the obit for Moses. And he ends up looking uh, pretty good, friends. Never since has there arisen a prophet in the land of Israel like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. He was unequaled for all the signs and wonders that the Lord sent him to perform in the land of Egypt against Pharaoh and all his servants and his entire land and for all the mighty deeds and all the terrifying displays of power that Moses performed in the sight of all Israel. Sounds pretty good, right? Never since has there been one like Moses who knew God in that way. And, and for us as Christians, not until Jesus is there someone who knows God in that way. Moses was closer to God than any living person had ever been before or would be for a thousand years. Moses is honored as doing mighty deeds of power, as being the greatest of the prophets. Pretty good for a guy that also fell short. You see, Mo Moses came back to faith. Moses got it back together. And Moses is celebrated there and continues to be celebrated as one who has done and has done mighty things for God. He shows up at Jesus' transfiguration, right? Where it's, you know, uh, Elijah and Jesus and Moses. He gets to be in the top hits of the Old Testament even though he falls short because he got it back together. He turned back from whatever it was that pulled him in the wrong direction, got back on track, again became the mighty servant of God, honoring and serving the Lord. And then in his passing, being honored and cared for by God and celebrated by God's people. Friends, we've got to remember that no one is just one thing. No one is just one thing. We like easy categories. We like there to be sinners, and we like there to be saints. And we like to put people and ourselves in one category or the other, right? Moses, definitely a saint, right? He's Moses. He's the prophet of God. He brings down the tablets from the, th from the mountain. He leads God's people to the promised land. Moses also definitely murders a guy um, early on in Moses' story and falls short the waters of Mirabah. Is Moses a sinner or is Moses a saint? Yes, he is. See, when my, and growing up, when you asked my dad whether he wants cake or ice cream, he would say, yes. Is Moses a sinner? 
or a saint? Yes. Are we sinners or saints? Yes. There I am willing to bet things in all of our lives that maybe we should turn back from. Maybe they are new habits induced by the world having gone a little crazy. Maybe they're bad habits that were in our lives already. But I'm willing to bet there is stuff in all of us that probably should go. But also, all of us can access the Holy Spirit. All of us have access to Christ's redemption. All of us can be a saint as well. Follow after God as well. Be loved by God as well. Turn back from whatever is dragging us back as well. Martin Luther, because they said everything in Latin back then, I guess, put this as salvatore et peccator. It simply means saved and yet a sinner. Are you a sinner? Are you a saint? Yes. We're kind of both at the same time. And God loves us. And God offers us a way to move more towards being a saint and over time be less of the other thing like Moses. Do want to add a side note that this does not mean there will never be earthly consequences for our actions. The nature of God's forgiveness and redemption does not always save us from the earthly consequences of our actions, merely offers us an opportunity away from the heavenly consequences for our actions. These are occasionally entirely separate things. You go and, you know, murder somebody in cold blood, the state of Texas may find a way to punish you for that. God will forgive you of that. There is a difference. Moses faced an earthly consequence. He was not allowed to enter the promised land. But he was not given a heavenly consequence. God forgave him and Moses got back on track and God honors Moses at his death as do the people. Yes, there was an earthly consequence, but it did not interrupt his relationship with God because Moses got back on track. And so, to close, my friends, simply remember, we can always turn back. We can always turn back. We always have the opportunity to grab on to God's way once again and let God pull us along in the right direction. God's grace and love is right there. We can turn back from the places we have fallen short and move back towards God. As Moses did, so can we. Let us pray. Gracious loving God, we give you thanks. We give you thanks that your grace is there for us. We can turn back from whatever is pulling us away. We can turn back from the places where we have fallen short. We can turn back towards you with the power of your love and with the power of your grace. Loving God, help us to find that strength in you to seek and receive that repentance that we may turn away from what pulls us back and live a life ever moving closer to you. In Jesus' most holy name we pray. Amen.